Coming to you from the all-new Live House in Hollywood, California. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of Pixar's Place. Our guest is going to give you the 411 on how you can monetize your music and also new ways for it to be heard. But first, we've got three more winners in the Warm Audio Summer Giveaway. Congratulations goes out to Thomas Ford from Nashville, John Cameron from Toronto, and Loretta Underwood from Los Angeles. Yay, congratulations, you guys. You'll get to choose from one of these four amazing condenser mics as your grand prize from Warm, either the 87, the 14, the 47 Junior FET, or the 84 Small Diaphragm, all condenser mics, all great stuff. And you can win as well if you hurry. Remember, we have three winners each week for another two weeks. So how do you enter? It's pretty simple. Go to warmaudio.com forward slash warm hyphen summer hyphen giveaway. That's warmaudio.com forward slash warm hyphen summer hyphen giveaway. Enter your information and boom, you're good. Uh, it's just that easy. So we hope to announce your name next week. Get cracking, get it in there. And also, while you're at it, join our family all over the globe. Sign up to our newsletter. Do us a favor as well. Like, subscribe, and click notify. And we thank you for that. Our guest has such an intriguing background. She was taught to play bass by the Rolling Stones bass player. She's a mixer. She's on the studio. And along the way, she's built one heck of a one-stop music house. Here's the CEO of 411 Music, Kristen Agee. Hey. Hi. How are you? Thank you you for having me. Now, there's a musical side, which goes very broad, and a player side, and a studio component side, and mixing and recording. Bass and violin. How did you get to those two instruments? Um, it started was with violin. A long right? journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess going even back before then. I, I guess we we always had a piano in the house, but then we got a drum set when I was like seven mm-hmm. um, that my brother and I shared, and then I got a guitar when I was nine that my brother took and started playing, and I think I just settled into violin when I was eleven, mm-hmm. and. I remember my first violin teacher didn't want to take me because she thought I was too old to learn when I was 11. 11. (laughs) But she looked at my hands and she was like, oh, you have fat fingers. Um, I'll take you anyway. And I was like, okay, so I'm too old and too fat. The fat fingers were an asset or she took you despite of them? Yeah, have you seen Itzhak Perlman? Mm -hmm. His hands are like the size of a violin. Mm. I mean, so it just, it's a different tonal, like textural, like, Sound, mm-hmm. meteor sound. Mm-hmm. Fat fingers um, make better sound. Apparently, so so I was told when I was wow. eleven. That's fascinating. Um, yeah, that's when I started playing violin, and it really, honestly, became like my that was it, really. And I I slowly I played sports when I was a kid, and I slowly stopped. I quit all of them, mm. and then um, it wasn't until like that was really my very intensive you know, Mm -hmm. study and thing. And I got really burnt out of music by the time I was graduating high school and moving to LA. Um, And so I gave up music for maybe like a year. And then when I got into it, I wanted to do sort of the opposite of violin. So to me, that was like playing drums Mm -hmm. again, Mm -hmm. getting into bass. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really want to focus or know anything about the theory of playing bass or music. Just I just it. wanted to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I got to a point where I was like, I need to know the theory. I need to play this better. And so I studied it a bit more after that. But Is that when Daryl Jones entered your yeah, life? Yeah, yeah. So that must have been incredible, right? Yeah, I mean, that was like a... that's That was really a big turning point for me. I mean, I, I guess I, I was playing bass in different bands. I was playing mm-hmm. bass and violin in various pro- projects. Mm-hmm. And, um, you were touring, doing I toured a tour. bit with oh, indie yeah. art, like totally unknown indie artists. Sure. Like, like a, I was in a dark folk rock band. I was in a jazz project. I was in a, like a heavier alternative rock band. Mm-hmm. I was super into like, you know, Smashing Pumpkins sure. and that whole like 90s rock scene mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and Nirvana. And before that, like, I was a punk rocker always. Mm-hmm, yeah. um, Smashing Pumpkins had a female bass player. What are all your favorite bands with a female bass player? Yeah, I mean, like, I thought I was going to be like Paz Lynchanton or something because <laughs> she's bass and violin. Mm-hmm. And so that was a bit of my path. And, um, but then I, I did go to, um, Pasadena City College and like I dropped out of, um, of University of California at Santa Barbara after a quarter mm-hmm. and I party school it, it, it was yeah, and it just wasn't like 
my thing, honestly. It felt like too much bureaucracy going back into the school system. I felt like I was done when I was in high school and I moved here and was just ready to work, I guess. Right. Um, and so, so yeah, but I, I did decide I'd like to learn, um, which is how I know. I mean, I've been watching Pensado's Place like since you guys started. Since the of time. Um, so being here is like, Oh, cool. Cool. Thank you. Equally cool. intimidating and like, ah. I'm like stoked. <laughs> I, I, I proved to you in the pre interview I'm an idiot, so you can be comfortable around me. I know we all kind of are. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> so, the, but there was, a, there was also a portion where you had your own studio or you ran it. Yeah. And so mixing and recording yeah. and all that is also part of the background. Correct? Yeah. I mean, it was all kind of like happening simultaneously. Like when I got back into music and I went to take all music classes at Pasadena City College, I I was doing bass, I was doing songwriting, I was doing, like, I was in, a, in choir, mm -hmm. um, doing vocal lessons, and, and then I uh, decided that I needed to really, like, understand and learn music in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, so... So it, like I was in the bands then and and I met Daryl. I just randomly went to this Ampeg sponsored like bass event that Daryl was hosting. Mm -hmm. So we were I think we were at like a we were like a Sam Ash or something in West LA and it was outside in this pavilion. I was the only girl mm. and by far the youngest person there and he taught this Ampeg like sponsored event and I waited in line to talk to him mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. and I was like 23 or something and he and I go hey like it's nice to meet you do you teach bass lessons and he was like um no but uh Maybe, and so I was like, okay, well, here's my card. I gave him my card with a picture of me playing violin on it. Mm -hmm. And he called me two weeks later and he taught me, I was his first student, um, and he taught me for like, I think a year and a half. Mm. Um, and it was during that time when I was, I was on this path to become this like session musician, touring bassist, violinist. Um, but through my lessons with him, I, started to understand the value of songwriting and ownership of assets. And I don't know if I necessarily understood that meant publishing, right. but I just like, it's like a light bulb went off and I shifted gears and, and instead, of, and I honestly didn't really like touring. It was hard. Yeah. It was hard sleeping on people's couches and being in vans with like stinky boys and yeah. being the only girl. That's and, tough. you know, um, in sound engineering school, same thing. Yeah. It was like, always the only girl and um and so i i shifted gears and when i did i started writing full time mm -hmm. um specifically for synchronization and then you had a couple years of of being executive and you learned more of your craft in terms of administration publishing songwriting sync all that kind of stuff yeah and then you decide to create your own company 411 correct kind of like i wish it was that linear right. but it's kind of just i think that I kind of just don't know what I'm doing ever and mm -hmm. I just go do it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, like still, I don't I know what I'm doing. But I, I literally just, um, I mean, because I had such a diverse background in music, like I was this punk rocker, but classical violinist. I was in orchestras and going to operas and then listening to like Fear and Misfits and Bad Brains and all of these punk bands. And, and then I, I interned at Epitaph Records in Silver Lake, um, when I was in sound engineering school. That's a heavy metal record. They do, like, it's like Rancid and yeah, like all of those yeah. like old school like punk bands Absolutely. and new yeah, new school, exactly. Like I actually t recorded Tim Armstrong for one day at his house and saw him like sample kicks and like yeah. just saw his recording process as a solo artist yeah. um, a bit, um, which was really, that taught me a lot like in itself. Um, but But yeah, it wasn't ever just this like very immediate path. Mm -hmm. It was always- It never is. Yeah, it was yeah. just- like, I'm gonna learn about sound engineering because I've only just played acoustic instruments, like violin. I was very, very stayed true to this like pure sounding acoustic thing mm -hmm. was always what I wanted. I never wanted to play electric violins or electric guitar or deal with amps or anything. Mm -hmm. um, but then I decided I needed to learn it, which is why I went to sound engineering school. Mm -hmm. um, but But yeah, like starting my own company was honestly just like, 
I think I took a UCLA extension class mm -hmm. with Bobby so. Borg mm -hmm. and had read his book, The Musician's Handbook, mm -hmm. and was like, I went in day one and was like, hey, Bobby, it's lovely to meet you. Mm -hmm. I'm starting a music publishing company. And he was like, well, calm down. Like, mm -hmm. just take this course first and then figure it out. I was like, okay, I'm just letting you know. Mm -hmm. And and I did. And I was I just honestly learned the ins and outs of publishing and everything I do from reading agreements as a composer and then starting a business and like just doing it. So tell us about 411. What what does it do? And so um basically we we do three different things, um, big picture things. We started with, I started signing one-stop indie artists. So we were signing masters and publishing rights um, so that we could clear both sides for sync easily. Um, and then I built a score catalog, uh, trailer music, sound design. We started sub and co-publishing, co-publishing US and international catalogs. And then because we dealt with so many writers and artists. We built a more traditional publishing arm where we're signing yes, writers we're signing, to publishing deals. Right. Yeah, right. we have writers. We do set up co-writes and songwriting camps. Mm -hmm. And then we are a sync agent for bigger um, publishing catalogs, mm -hmm. um, some of which are also one-stop. And then we do custom music. So mm -hmm. I head up all of our custom music and still steer the ship when it comes to scoring all of our shows mm -hmm. and writing for video games and ads and trailers and promos and all of that stuff. Television and film. Yep. And video games and all kinds of Yeah, basically wherever, anything, anything that needs music. All media. Anything gotcha. that has music in it, like, we will. What are some sync. of the shows that 411 has done music for? Um, we do a lot. Of for scoring, we do. Um, we've done the last season of Undercover Boss. Mm -hmm. We're doing the next season of Undercover Boss. We're working on that now. We've done the last four seasons of Chris Lee Knows Best on USA. Mm -hmm. um, Twenty Four Hours to Helm Back, Gordon Ramsay Show. Mm -hmm. um, Shark Week. I Shark, Shark Week. week. <laughs> Shark Week. <laughs> of all of the shows. <laughs> I love Shark Week. <laughs> of, I swear to God, I I list all these shows, massive shows like primetime net uh -huh. network shows, uh -huh. Game of Thrones. Yeah. I get to Shark Week and everyone's like, <gasps> Shark Week? Mm -hmm. It's like stops yeah. them in their tracks. It's Shark Week. It's just like insane to me. How does one get on your radar to be signed? <laughs> is the talent there? Oh, man. Like, are you feeling, how big is the roster first off? Um, well, so on the, on the one-stop side, which is basically in essence like a production music catalog yeah. um, with some one-stop artists, is about 30,000 tracks, unique mm -hmm. titles. And then the more traditional artist publishing side, um, with our sync catalogs, we probably have like 70,000 tracks. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but within that, we, we have one writer, F Tampa. He's like one of the biggest EDM mm -hmm. DJs to come out of Brazil, mm -hmm. but he's very pop, has crossed over the pop side in a big way. He lives here. Um, he signed to us on the publishing side, Sony on the master side. Um, but then we set up a bunch of co-writes with writers that we don't even necessarily have signed. Right. Um, but we will rep their publishing whenever we set them up with, with co-writes. When yeah. someone comes to you, how do you get them to go sort through 70,000 70, songs? I mean, they usually don't. Like we, we have the catalog sort of divided. So everything that's, we have a search engine, um, that people can go and search and, and. So, so you, you kind of tag each song with the, with the mood? Oh yeah. I mean, it's like an extensive process, processing our music. It's yeah. once, once we actually decide on music that we're going to take in, and we have to decide where it's going to live. So if, is it going to be on that sort of one stop sign and get distributed with those partners? Or is it, is this an up and coming artist? Mm -hmm. Is this someone we can launch? Um, so we have to divide it in that way first. But then we have, I have an asset manager and production manager who bring in all of the, the music and do metadata. Yeah. Moods, keywords. Like we have naming conventions for our tracks and mm -hmm. it's a, it's a very, does, specific does, process. Does film and TV, oh, let me rephrase that. Is, is, is each of the individual places where you place like film, TV, uh, trailers, movies, do they all require different genres or do they all kind of just take whatever they think they like? Is there, a, is there a trend there? Yeah. And then, I mean, and it's, then what is the trend? It's, um, it's, it's like, it's a very, it's actually a quite complicated 
process, doing synchronization, publishing work, and and pitching and placing. So um, to answer your question, like we do have a catalog that's searchable, but most of our clients come to us with searches. They'll say, hey, we need a song like this, mm -hmm. or we need to fill in this, you know, like we need a song that's playing on this car radio sure. while they're driving in Kentucky mm -hmm. in like this vibe mm -hmm. or whatever. And so we will give them music that would apply to that but specific how you scene. you remember the 70,000 songs? <laughs> I mean, honestly, like we just do. And that's, we're, we're not even like a massive catalog. Like we're pretty like mid-sized, I would say, mm -hmm. um, to, to, compared to others, to small. Mm -hmm. Um, so I honestly, like our team, we process every piece of music. It's not just like everybody give us all your music and we, we put it out. Like we listen to it. It's very specific. It's curated. Mm -hmm. Um, so we, we know the catalog pretty well. Mm -hmm. Um, but then with keywords and moods and all of that, we're able to search what's it. The, what's the average length of time that a song doesn't go stale? Like someone brings a song in, you, you shop it a few times. Yeah. After. Five years, you throw it in the no, trash? No, no, definitely not. I think it depends on the, like, what kind of music it is. Like, we we actually work with archival music catalogs from the 30s to today. Okay. And that, those do really well for us because, like, we did this Tory Burch ad in the UK um, with this 60s, like, sort of Beach Boys sounding mm. song. Um, and... And they wanted it to be like from like sound like from that era, mm -hmm. and and so we get requests from like you know, look think about all the the period pieces like Mad Men gotcha. or Marvelous Mrs. Maisel or uh -huh. you know whatever it is it takes place from in a certain time even like Breaking Bad or we get requests for films that are pre two thousand four so it's not just from like the fifties or uh -huh. you know thirties mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, so we have bands that will sign back catalogs of that are still relevant now. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the beauty of what we do as publishers because, you know, as a sync house and a creative sync team, we're not just focused on hits. We're right. focused on what can we place it, in a movie. It's matchmaking. Exactly. Yeah. What, yeah. what can we place in a scene? Um, and, and that is a whole host of various mm -hmm. genres, eras, moods, whatever. And, and so we're ultimately, really kind of looking if, for everything. Ultimately, if you become good at that, then clients know the house is good at it. Then they call because they can rely on your yeah. taste and other things coming through. Right. So you build this existential trust between the client and yourself. And it puts more pressure on you guys to know your catalog and be able to hit that market. For sure. Time, right? Yeah, I mean, sometimes with new clients, I mean, people know us now, but... With new clients, if you mess up a search or two, they mm -hmm. just won't reach out to you because nobody has time. Right. But it's it's not even just the creative and the search part. It's understanding and knowing that the rights are cleared. Right. We have a, we have to do our due diligence to make sure yeah, right. there are no samples and still like things happen. You know, like yeah. on massive like major labels, mm -hmm. massive projects, big video games. Mm -hmm. Like I've been sat on panels where. Um, video game companies we work with have done releases of of a game, and then they find out after the fact that a major label artist didn't clear a sample that was on a track that they used. That's a problem. So they had to pull it and like re-release it. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it happens all the time. Sure. So sure. we do. I have a business affairs manager who's amazing, and she will if like she's my little investigator. She will find you. Mm -hmm. Like if mm -hmm. if you have a co-writer, if you have signed a publishing deal in the past, like she'll find you and and we'll make sure that it's either expired or clear for us to use or there's just a, a process that we have to go through. What are some of that. the monetization models per service? You know, sync, is that a one-time payoff? Is there participation in other things and licensing? How does the money work for for the client and for the company? Yeah. The client so is assigned to you. Yeah, so we, um, there's sync and master use license fees. Mm -hmm. Um, so the sync is paying for the publishing and copyright, basically the song. Yeah. The master is the actual recording. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and typically it's like, we'll get a request for, let's say, like, 
five thousand dollars all in, which mm -hmm. means like for both sides. Yeah. Um, so that that's the upfront income, and then the back end um, gets very complicated. But there's the publishing, the writer share that you collect for the performing rights organizations yep. directly. Um, so the royalties whenever something streams. You're, co you're collecting for the pros for the PRs. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Wow. As a publisher and, and sure. administrator. Do you strike a traditional deal with? The talent is. It, are your deals mostly the same? Or some sort of split relationship? Yeah, or? we have like basic um, templates and industry standards. Whether it's like production music work for hires, mm -hmm. or whether it's like more traditional publishing deals mm -hmm. um, and co-writes. Um, but then we also start with a blank slate mm -hmm. with each writer and artist. And I'm like, okay, well, what are you doing? What are your goals? Mm -hmm. And we go from there. So do you do you sign the artist as a writer, or you just or you prefer to sign just his songs? We do both. So if we most mostly what we've done to date is signing the songs or the mm -hmm. album. Um, so then that leaves that writer um, like a little bit more flexibility to be able to do other work for hires or work for other people. If it's a, a writer or artist we're launching, um, then we will sign them to a publishing deal because we're investing a lot into them as a, as their publisher. If if if, um, if I came to you and said I wanted to work with you, um, is there a genre or a type of song or a type of person that you always gravitate towards? Is there is there any inside info that I can give the audience that can help them get to you and have them? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's. Them? I think with with what we do specifically, it, we need every type of genre because it's sync related. Yeah. I mean, we get requests for K-pop, J-pop, like very obscure, like um, like regional Chinese music or like um, Ethiopian jazz or like drumline or New Orleans style. Like it's just wherever you can imagine a scene happening in any content right. is what we would need music for. Right. But we we have like, I would say mostly... Um, buckets of bigger genres. So over, like, we always need more hip hop. Mm -hmm. um, we always need. That's a headline like, right there. Yeah, we always need more hip hop. Mm -hmm. That should be a band name. Um, we always need more like female empowerment, um, like swagger rock mm -hmm. for promos, um, like that sort of like badass, mm -hmm. like black keys kind of sound, or like, um, like who are some of the like. Imagine dragons, sure. epic building, Anthem, Anthem. honestly building. Mm. Even as an artist, like if you're not specifically writing for sync, if you put builds into your songs, like M83, like they have these massive arcs, you know, and then it grows. Mm. And that gives editors flexibility to score d scenes with. Which is more popular, songs with lyrics or songs without? I mean, it depends on, on the... Yeah, like when we do when we score TV shows, it's all mostly underscore. There's no there are no vocals. Right. But when we do licenses, a lot of our artists are what gets used. Mm -hmm. um, so people will pull our score. But what what I would say is really important for all artists and writers to have is a vocal and instrumental. You always want to have as much as you yeah, possibly we, can. We try to do that in the mix process. Give them yeah. Those. So get stems. Um, and even if you have sub mixes, like if you have a, a no lead guitar and a no drum and bass or drum and bass only, um, anything like that allows more flexibility with mixing and editing mm -hmm. is what we always ask for. What is, what is sonic branding? Sonic branding is basically where, um, you, you, you're basically deciding on the sound of a brand. Of a brand. So right. when we, like, if, we were doing like rebrands for big networks mm -hmm. like a, like a decade ago. Mm -hmm. um, they were changing their sound for their their logo card, yep. and so um, you know we basically it's like a three second right. sound, mm -hmm. right. um, or even like jingles that you know mm -hmm. very well mm -hmm. for ads, like mm -hmm. stuff like that. Is but it's, it's defining for a brand a sound that exactly. you associate with it, Got and it. even like well, like you know we were just like showing HBO earlier, mm -hmm. like their sound is that like it's just a sound. Right. It's like a it scares uh, uh, when I don't realize. <laughs> yeah, it. and that is that's their sonic brand, mm -hmm. and that is something that had to be created, and it's very specific. Mm -hmm. um, sonic branding is like, and and theme type stuff is very specific because yeah. of dealing with brands and mm -hmm. everything that goes into dealing mm -hmm. with brands. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking about the explosion of 
streaming, visual content, television, film, just Netflix's output. Yeah. You know, talk about Amazon, Hulu, and so on and so forth. So this is a burgeoning area, correct? Mm-hmm. And it's global, for sure. Yeah. So there's no limitations in terms of your reach. Right. Right. You have offices and relationships around the world? How oh, yeah. Work? I mean, we have, um, we're have. we direct as publishers, administrators in the U.S., U.K., Canada. We have a rep in Switzerland. Um, and then we have worldwide partners everywhere else. Mm-hmm. So we have either sub-publishers or, you know, partnerships in basically every territory. Do you provide all the same publishing services as a major publisher? Yeah. Yeah, gotcha. yeah, 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 definitely. Gotcha. Except, like, I, I would argue more curated in mm-hmm. a way. I mean, the majors are great, and we work with them, and they have a server purpose and have a place. But for us, I think what people come to us because we're an indie. Like, right. we are a fully independent, female-owned and operated company, Mm -hmm. um, which has its own benefits and and quirks, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, like standalone. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, I guess people come to us after they've dealt with bigger companies Mm -hmm. and are like, we want to work with someone who is who is putting creative first, mm-hmm. who's there with us, it's who uh, who knows our, the catalog. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you talked about like 70,000 songs being a lot. I mean, these bigger uh, companies have millions of copyrights. Right. That, and they, sometimes they don't even know their catalog. They can't. Right, it's too big. Um, it's too big. Yeah. And and again, like there's a purpose for that. Mm-hmm. But, but people come to us when they want something that is an alternative to that mm-hmm. idea. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You said... Um, that sync was a new way into the music business. Can you just expand on that? Yeah, and I think like it's not even like new now because uh-huh. like look at all the bands that have launched from sync opportunities. Explain you know, that, like I'm, I'm not well, like I, I mean, it was really like the Grey's Anatomy and like those kinds of shows that could launch. I mean, it's still happening. Like we had an artist um, called Wem who we placed on an end title. So it was the end credit Mm -hmm. of New Girl. Mm -hmm. And I think it was the last episode. And it's the singer songwriter, like very independent, like very young artist. Um, And we placed her song on this end title. And then all of a sudden her plays spiked on everything, mm-hmm. Spotify, mm-hmm. Um, Apple, mm-hmm. iTunes. So, so you actually make sure that those are all coordinated, Spotify and Tidal and all that? Yeah, I mean, basically like... when that hits the, the TV or the film. Yeah, I mean, this was like an already released artist uh-huh. and her music was already out there. They put this song on an end title and then all of her plays started, started mm-hmm. spiking. And then she had fans hitting her up every, like hundreds of fans every day mm-hmm. um, saying that they saw that and heard her her song. Mm-hmm. And so it put her on the map enough where she could quit her day job and start writing and was like, I'm going to really give music a go. And Is she and, signed to you as an artist? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We have her, her al- I think two of her albums now. So you do artist development too? Yeah, I guess you could say that. I mean, we're not like a label, um, but... I, what I like doing is putting people together who would never otherwise work together. Mm-hmm. Um, whether that's like, we have this amazing blues roots soul guy who I want to pair with these hip hop pr- producers. Sure. And those, they would never otherwise work together or know each other, but I think that could be a, a new, cool, interesting sound oh, that absolutely. they can create together. That, the output of that merger would, would, benefits you have like for film or tv or you don't know yet or yeah i mean i think um with that in particular it's getting the music obviously like a new sound Mm -hmm. um new stuff to release and pitch to at we were thinking specifically ad agencies for this Mm -hmm. but these these artists that i want to put together in particular have a bit of a brand and a following and fan base so we were going to pitch them to brands also as like um, like being on camera and being mm. almost like like endorsing and um, having sponsorships with brands. Do you have pressures of when you sign an artist <clears throat> and they're going to put pre- put music out? Do you have pressures of distribution and acting like a label? And yeah, we do distribution yeah. and and I mean, I guess like you know, we don't necessarily. Um, like, yeah, we have digital distribution. We're not necessarily putting a marketing budget into mm-hmm. a release like a label would, mm-hmm. ideally. Mm-hmm. Um, but everything that we release, we put out, we try to release digitally as well. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. What's the worst mistake that you would say people make when they come to you for uh, your services? 
Um, something that what that, artists? Well, just in general, like um, someone's listening to this show and and they want to get in touch with you. What what would you caution them about being the wrong thing to do in terms of approaching or the wrong way? Or never attach an MP3 to an email. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> that is the biggest thing. Like. Um, we, that is all like 101 pitching like guidelines. Don't ever attach music to an email. It clogs up everyone's inboxes. Oh. Um, sometimes it doesn't even go through. Mm -hmm. Then I have to download it and then it's like on my computer and it's harder to share with my team. Yeah. So what I say, I mean, we have a submission link on our website. Okay. Um, but when people submit music to me, it, it actually, I mean, to, people, people do submit music to me, but I have a production team who's also handling it now. But um, a link with your music and what you do and what you want, basically. Like, it doesn't need to be a novel. It's mm -hmm. just like, here's a link to my music. I wrote 100% of these songs. I own them 100%. Or I have this co-writer. Mm -hmm. Or I wrote for these companies and have had these syncs. Mm -hmm. And this is what I want. Then done. Cut to the chase. That's yeah. really what, you have to be mindful of people's time. Yeah, yeah. if I get a novel of an email, mm -hmm. I scroll to the bottom and click on the link and listen. Mm -hmm. And if it's good, I'll skim it. Right. Um, if not, if not, I'm just like, next. Moving on. I just don't. Yeah. Do, I don't. I never read it, and yeah. that may sound harsh, but it's. But it's the business. I, we receive that also from clients. Mm -hmm. You know, like mm -hmm. it's it's hard to get people's attention, and there's so much out there. Um, you have to be able to cut through the noise somehow. All right, so we're going to cut through the noise with something called Batter's Box. Oh, great! And um, I think you're going to be ready. <laughs> yeah, she's from. Ed, I won one last she's week. From Edmond, Oklahoma. I won one last week. And it wasn't on the show. Is this a winning or I'll, losing? I'll see only one. There's only one there. <laughs> Not for you. You 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 just go. Oh God! Go great. Kristen. Here we go. <laughs> All right, you ready? Yes. P R O. B M I. Ooh. We'll write that down. Uh, <laughs> video games. Um, e A. Mm -hmm. Favorite barber. Favorite barber, Leela, <laughs> my hairdresser, Leela Barrett. She's amazing. Electric violin. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> Acoustic only. Acoustic would be the word. Los Angeles Recording School. Los Angeles Recording School. Um, I mean, I think of SSLs. I think of tape machines okay. too, actually. Publishing. Um, four one one. Your favorite festival. Oh God, the 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 no festival festival. <laughs> um, okay, music discovery, a place where you discover new music. Oh God, I think you're gonna hate this answer. Um, Spotify. I love that answer. I'm on Spotify every day. <laughs> Punk. Fear. Mm. Bass or violin. Violin. I, I can see she was good. Yeah. Uh, it's funny to watch you tap out so early. It's like a UFC match. I, I didn't go early. I had, I had like a million of them. Uh, what's, go give, on. give us another one. Uh, I ain't got one. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you have to pull the rug out. <laughs> Wait, I feel like I should do this for you. Oh, okay, oh, go. Yeah. Come up with um, Come up with Just three. off the cuff. Okay. Um, microphone. Um, C12. Okay. Recording... Software. Um, Pro Tools. Um, Followed closely by uh, okay. Ableton Live. Okay. Um, artist. Um, Dominic Fike. Okay. Done. Good. Three, three favorite nights. favorite three festival. Nights. Three Nights is my favorite song right now. Um, I haven't been to one in, in a little bit, but if I was to go to one, I'd probably go to Electric Daisy. And yeah, Paris. that's a, a good answer. Okay, then I retract my not liking of festivals. ADE in Amsterdam uh -huh. is, I speak there usually, um, in, uh, it's every October. It's one of my favorite, hands down, favorite. Fest it's, it's a festival, but it's a conference this industry first, okay, thing. Let me turn the tables. On all your responsibilities, which ones are your favorite? All of my responsibilities? As a, as your, as 411. Oh, God. Um, you, know, you know the follow-up question, too, right? I can tell you my least favorite. Well, that's what if the follow-up follow with. That's <laughs> easier. My least favorite is managing people. Mm. It's, for me, so hard. I love my team so much, and they're so good. But it is like, I'm such an autonomous, very independent, mm. like, 
your immediate team's about eight people, nine people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's seven of us in LA. We have one in Switzerland. Um, and we had a person in the UK who we we're looking for a new oh, person. Oh, I know what. You, you know that, that big long list of all the countries you're in? Yeah. Like, how, how, you don't have literally offices in every country. You, no, those we are have people that you contract yeah, with. Yeah, those are our like our sub publishing partners. There's like a lot of those. Yeah, yeah, we're in every territory. You I mean, have you to, have to be. You have to be. We have to collect basically directly through our our publishing partnerships. Oh, so that's for collection, not for collection for, not and for, for pitching. Right. In, in for terms creative of and pitching. pitching Outside of America and say England and France mm-hmm. and Italy, which which country gets the most buys the most from you? Um, the biggest territories for us and generally, I think, are well. I guess it depends, but the U.S., U.K., Australia, Germany, Australia, yeah. um, and and then like there's this the Asian market is becoming really interesting. Um, is it hard to collect from there? It can be. And the pay, like, once you start getting into collection, we could do a whole two hour seminar on collection of performing mm-hmm. rights. It gets complicated. The way that people pay out is different in every territory. Mm-hmm. Um, and what they pay for and don't pay for. Um, it's very random covered, territory to territory. It is. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's yeah. very specific. Is that covered by some sort of international law or is this just the wild west out there? Yeah. Some, in some places. Um, Like the UK is a very different licensing market than the US. Mm. Um, Russia is actually an up and coming, uh, sort of emerging Mm. market for sync and collection. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's probably honestly one of my favorite things that I do about like at 411, Uh, going back to that question. uh It's literally, I think, being able to travel and talk to all of our global partners uh-huh. and work on an international basis with everyone mm-hmm. is like figuring out different markets for me is really fun. Which 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 area is the most lucrative? Uh, video games, TV, film, uh, et, cetera, et cetera, We do the most with television. television. Um, I would say television and ads because mm-hmm. um, we score so many shows mm-hmm. And, and the consistency of them running yeah, regularly, right? We, yeah, exactly. Like I mean, the royalties on primetime major network shows are great. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's undeniable. But then you get more on the upfront, typically, with ads. You can mm-hmm. bit a, get a bigger dollar amount, like, faster. Mm-hmm. Um, but Do they last as long? The, the- yeah, usually it's like, you know, if an ad keeps renewing, like, we've been renewing some ads in different territories, mm-hmm. and they will renew the ad and pay you again. Mm-hmm. Um, but typically, it's like the TV shows that you really, like want to rely on pipeline royalties right. on exactly. um, that keep running or or just like continuing to to do new music mm-hmm. for shows. Do you find that that a lot of people are still trying to cheat you or or is it is it you- <laughs> there's no way of knowing, you know, but is it is it a problem? Um like in what way? Copyrights that they don't honor? Oh yeah. Oh totally. I mean, but there are processes in, in place in order to manage that, you know, like we monitor our music through various sources. Oh, and so that's all like fingerprinted. Mm-hmm. Um, what so, does that mean? So like, it, like there's a watermark for music? watermarking and fingerprinting, like basically each track has a unique either fingerprint or watermark or whatever mm-hmm. it is. Um, and as soon as it, goes onto these platforms, it picks up the usage. Right. And then we monitor that usage and see if there if there was any like, you know, copyright infringement. If do, somebody just used our music without a license. Do you find yourself in a position to have to litigate and go after people? I mean we is, haven't, is but process? it happens. Yeah. I mean that isn't my favorite thing, no, which, sucks. but it's I have fun. other people who do that for us now, which is great. But um I don't like that mm-hmm. um, part of what we do, so I don't do it. It's, it's but but it is something we have to do. Yeah. So here's the other question: You made it through. Are you, are, did you get through your nervousness and stuff? You did good. What with here? The show? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. No, this is great. Now you're comfortable. Yeah, you're good. good. How did I do on, on answering your question? You did. You did pretty good. Pretty good. This is okay. That was perfect. I feel like I need to give you more challenge. Like if I was more prepared. <laughs> we'll, we'll let you Next time I'll prepare and I'll give you. We'll be able to do a batter's box attack. And then yeah. We'll we'll Thanks for doing that. I like that. That, that was fun. Uh, congratulations. Oh, uh, thank you. It's a complicated you. space. It um, is. Um, yeah. It is, I mean, it is not I'm so honored to be on this show. No, you guys no, have no it's, idea. It's a, it's a, like, it's a pleasure. We love Nicole. I feel like so. totally unqualified to be on no, this no, show. No, no, no. You're qualified. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're well, qualified. what you did is... You well, get a lot of, lot the, of people calling you. The other side yeah. of it is 
it's a complicated space. It is. It's not for the faint of heart. No. You got to love music. You got to find good people. Yeah. You got a lot of responsibility and people looking. So you should not feel, don't worry about this yeah, show. Yeah, yeah. You're doing No, it's great. Really I mean, I well. love doing stuff like this. And like, honestly, just coming and doing this, I learned so much from you guys. And, and like, I mean, that's you know, what we wanted to share with the yeah. audience. Yeah. As I soon as Nicole it. hit me, I was like, yep. <laughs> I love it. Amazing. Um, Come back anytime. It's a pleasure to Thank have you. you. Congratulations I will absolutely on what you're doing. come back. We'll have to look through your roster and find some of your folks and maybe have them on. So we'll Yes, please do. Out. Dave, take us home. Check this out. Herb says all the time, not all the time, but quite often, and I think he's 100% correct, that there's more about music and, and audio than just being an engineer, an audio engineer making records. There's so many facets of your creativity in the music world that can, that can help increase your income. And... Um, We've shown you a couple over the last few weeks, and, and, and this one is, is, is easily my favorite that we've ever done. Uh, listen to some of these options, man, and take your music and, and let it let it get out to the public, let people hear it and let people see it, and then get rewarded for it. Um, and then and do a little more research. There's so many different ways out there now and so many different opportunities that we've never had before. Yeah, selling records is a little harder right now, but the pathway to other things uh, as Kristen has said, is there. So you've got to know those other things in order to monetize them. So check it out. We'll see you next week.